Hello, everyone, and welcome to our third webinar of the UPS and Startup Canada Women's Exporter Program. Can't believe we're already in mid-November onto our third webinar. I'm Nadia Ladek, Program Lead for the Startup Global and Women's Exporter Program here at Startup Canada, and it's really nice to see everyone again. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which I am on today is located on the unceded territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendats peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. We also acknowledge with respect the diverse histories and cultures of all Indigenous peoples. I encourage each and every one of you to also take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are each residing on today as well. Now, today's session is being recorded, and it will be sharing the recording afterwards, so there's no need to write all those notes. We'll also be sharing it for you to rewatch later as well. We invite each of you to introduce yourself in the chat. Feel free to share your name, your organization, and where you're tuning in from today. Make sure that you're sending the message to everyone in the room, because I know Zoom defaults to only send to the hosts and panelists, but we want to make sure that everyone can connect with each other. Now, a bit about Startup Canada. We are a national nonprofit that is the gateway to Canada's entrepreneurial ecosystem. We're here to connect entrepreneurs with the support, community, and tools that they need to build a successful business in Canada. Since launching in 2012, we've grown to support more than 130,000 entrepreneurs annually and an ever-growing grassroots community network from coast to coast to coast. In partnership with UPS Canada, we're really proud to present the Women's Exporter Program. It's a global initiative that helps to bridge the gender gap in education and export participation by providing targeted assistance to women-owned small and medium-sized businesses. Now, today's webinar in particular is all about the logistics of exporting your product. We're going to provide an overview of the different modes of transportation, the logistics, and everything else that's involved in actually going out and exporting your product. We'll also deliver some guidance on handling documentation and navigating the different customs procedures. So this is going to be an awesome session. We have a presentation prepared by UPS, followed by a panel with an incredible entrepreneur that you're going to be really fortunate to meet very soon. And I've prepared some questions for them, but of course, we want you to drop any questions you have into the Q&A box as well. This session really is for you, and we'll try and answer as many questions as we can live as well. So now, without further ado, I'd love to pass it over to our first speaker for the day, Paul Gaspar, the Director of Small Business at UPS Canada. Take it away, Paul. Thank you, Nadia, and thank you everyone for joining us today as we continue this important journey of supporting women-led businesses, getting themselves ready to scale around the world. Now, before I get started, I need to apologize a little bit for my parents. It's uh, it's the month of November, so there's uh, quite a few causes that I'm supporting personally and myself. So uh, being halfway through the month, I'm in that awkward uh, point where uh, I've got too much growth, but not enough growth. But uh, hopefully you can bear bear with me as I go through uh, my presentation here today. Uh, as Nadia outlined, uh, today we're getting a little bit more hands-on as we focus on the how to actually export our products. Uh, well, I have a lot to cover, so let's get ourselves started uh, and we'll get right into the, the first slide. Perfect. Now, to do this, we really need to understand the basics. Uh, and shipping involves a variety of terminology and concepts that can be overwhelming for businesses and individuals new to the shipping process. Now, I believe most of you are already shipping locally or across our country, but I want to start here because moving products across borders and oceans is a little different than across streets and provinces. There are several modes of transport for shipping goods, including air, ocean, rail, truck, and even courier. And each mode has its own advantages and disadvantages, depending on the type of product being shipped, the destination, and the timeline. The key here is destination and timeline. So moving product to the other side of the world or just south to the US will take more time which will also mean more cost. So what I want you to think about with this first slide, and it's also my first tip for today, planning in advance will save you time and money. So it's critical to really do that. Planning your logistics with time will provide you with more options, which will save you time and ensure that you are the right or have the right solution in place for that shipment. For example, ocean or full truckload for large orders with more time, it'll cost less, but again, it takes more time for those products to make it to its destinations. On the flip side, you've got air or courier, 
for smaller orders to get there faster, but it can cost more. So it's a balance. And again, that's why it's so important that you do plan in advance. So as we move on to the next slide, now, no matter who your carrier is, your shipping rates or costs are influenced by several key elements. And some of these you might know, and some of these you might not really think about a lot. Obviously, distance is one, right? So the further your product uh, or shipment needs to go, uh, the more cost uh, that you need to consider. Weight, and everyone always thinks about the physical weight uh, of a product, but what's also important when you're actually shipping is the actual size, or what we call the dimensional weight. And this is something that's determined by actually calculating the length and girth, which is the, you know, the, the outside of the actual shipment or package that you're actually shipping. And size is critical because if you're shipping something that's really light, but big, taking up a lot of space, uh, size can become the factor uh, of what your cost will be. So that is critical to understand that uh, depending on your product. Your mode of transportation, be it fast versus slow, you need to really understand what your options would be. Going back to that previous slide, planning in advance, because that will help when you're determining the uh, overall cost. Uh, and then sometimes the actual goods, right? So think of examples like dangerous goods, perishable goods, items like that, there are other factors and potentially other costs that come into this. So understanding that in advance will ensure that you know what those impacts could be to your bottom line. Plus, in the courier world, if your package is not in a cardboard box, there are additional costs. If you look at the bottom right of the screen, you'll see, it's a little hard to see, but there's some examples there where you might have um, uh, items that are not actually packaged in the cardboard boxes. It doesn't matter which courier environment you are utilizing, which carrier, um, to move that through our environment, we can't effectively do that because it doesn't go through our belt systems. So we have to handle those more. And by handling those products more, more cost to us, that gets passed on, right? So understanding all that is critical. So tip two, by understanding and planning how your goods will be packaged, the distance they will travel, weight and size, all will help you manage the process and more important, your expense. I've seen way too many examples that product weight and sizes could have been different and saved on shipping costs if only if it was part of the planning process sooner. And I'll discuss that a little bit more when we talk about packaging. But now let's move on to the next slide and look at documentation. So documentation is important for any shipment, but internationally, the addition of a commercial invoice and depending on what you're shipping and where it is going, other customs forms. And this is really, really important. We should all be familiar with uh, some of the forms that you see in the slide right now. For example, on the far left, there's a packing list, which provides the detailed breakdown of the goods being shipped. It can be used to ensure that the correct items are included in the shipment. And believe it or not, sometimes it's also utilized to facilitate customs clearance processes. So even though there's a commercial invoice, customs can also be looking at the packing slip to make sure things are matching and to try to look for potentially more information that might not be on a commercial invoice. In the middle, we've got the bill of lading or what in the courier world we call is a shipping label. And this is your legal document that serves as a contract between the shipper and the carrier for the transportation of the goods. And you might be wondering, contract, really, Paul? I mean, if don't I actually sign a, a more generic type of an agreement with my shipping provider? You do, and that could be for rates and overall uh, what uh, is being agreed to from both parties. But what a bill of lading or shipping label does is that's the contract for that specific shipment. Because on that label, it's telling, in the example here for UPS, where am I picking up this package? Where am I sending it to? What the weight is for me to then charge you for that weight? And what service am I committing to getting that package delivered to you? So that is at a shipment level an agreement between you and the carrier, and it has a lot of important information that needs to be accurate. And this takes us to the commercial invoice on the far right of the screen. Commercial invoice is a document that provides details about the goods being shipped 
including the quantity, the value, and description of the goods. It is used for customs purposes to determine the correct duties and taxes to be charged on a shipment. And a commercial invoice is usually prepared by the seller or the exporter and is required for all international shipments. And that's important because sometimes um, we've, we've dealt with some exporters that are like, well, I'm shipping this to the U.S. and we've got a, um, a, a FDA agreement, uh, sorry, not FDA, a free trade agreement, sorry, with uh, the U.S., uh, Kuzma, so therefore I don't need it. That is wrong. Every shipment needs a commercial invoice, whether or not there's a free trade agreement in place or not. And we'll discuss a little bit more and we'll add uh, and we'll also add in the chat a few different links from UPS and even one from CBSA that provide more details on the form as well as step-by-step -step instructions on how to complete one. But for now, all of these documents are critical for the shipping process as they provide essential information for carriers, customs officials, and buyers or receivers of the goods. So it's important for businesses and individuals to ensure that all the shipping documents are accurate and complete to avoid delays, fees, and even potential legal issues for you. Okay, let's move on. So you have uh, carefully planned how you're going to ship your product and you have it packed with all the required forms. But have you clearly defined in the contract of that shipment between you and your supplier or just dis your, your distributor or even di directly to your customer, who is responsible for it during the shipping process? Well, this is tip number three. International commercial terms, also known as equal terms, are a set of standardized tr uh, trade terms used in the international commerce to define the responsibilities and costs of buyers and sellers in a transaction. They were created by the International Chamber of Commerce, ICC, to facilitate trade and provide a common language for buyers and sellers. You can see on the slide are, that there are currently a level uh, sorry, 11 equal terms in total, each of which defines responsibilities and costs associated with different stages of the shipping process. Let me give you an example. At the top, you see EXW, also referred to as XWorks. In this specific uh, agreement, if you were to actually pick this terms, the seller, uh, and let's say it's yourself selling to someone in another country, you are responsible for making the goods available at your premises. That is it. The buyer is responsible for all the transportation and costs and risks, right? Now, think about that. I've talked to some businesses that are actually looking for uh, manufacturers of their products from countries overseas. Let's just say, for example, India or even China. And I've uh, talked to a few where they almost got caught because they're looking at a couple of different suppliers for them and realized that one was giving them a better rate. What they didn't realize is that the one that was more expensive, they were covering all of the transportation costs all the way to that customer in Canada. Where the other one that looked like had a better offer, they were providing X works, which basically meant your product is ready. It's on my dock. You have to figure out now how to come and get it and bring it all the way to yourselves. So you really need to understand that as a buyer and as a seller that you have the right terms. In the courier world, most shipments default to a prepaid option, which on the list that you see here is the DAP, delivery at place, the one highlighted with the red box. The seller in this scenario is responsible for arranging and paying for the transportation of the goods to the final destination, as well as insurance against loss or damage during transit. The only thing that the buyer is responsible for is customs clearance and all other costs and risks from that point onward. So again, to try to put that into an example, if you were to use this option and you were shipping something to the US, you're responsible if you're shipping through U UPS to actually have UPS take that all the way and deliver it to the house or loading dock or wherever your customer's located. But your customer is responsible for any customs 
charges, brokerage, taxes, anything on that. Now, again, a lot of businesses these days are looking at taking on that additional cost as well uh, so that the customer doesn't have to see that as a separate item cost. But today, still, the number one is prepaid, uh, which is what I just uh, described for you. Now, the equal terms used in a transaction can have a significant impact on shipping responsibilities and costs, as you can see, right? So it's very important for buyers and sellers to carefully consider the equal terms that they use, ensure that they are clearly defined in the contract to avoid misunderstandings and disputes. So working with a knowledgeable shipping and logistics provider can also help businesses navigate these complexities of equal terms and ensure that the shipments are managed effectively and efficiently. Because the last thing you need is to have uh, disputes when it's coming to responsibilities of shipping, when you've worked so hard to buy something from a supplier or to sell something to a customer or distributor. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. And here, I'm going to share with you the best, pra I was going to share, I should say, with you the best practices for packaging to ensure safe transport and how to reduce the risk of damage to your product. But what we will do is we'll share some links uh, in the chat that will outline that for you. It'll uh, provide you information to ensure that you use the right materials when you're actually shipping, uh, what you need to consider for the nature of your goods, whether it's fragile versus something that's heavy. And do you have to, for example, double box? Or even if you should test your packaging uh, with your providers before you actually start shipping a lot of your packages out. So there's a lot of information. Again, some of the links will be in the chat that you can utilize to get some of that information. But instead, what I wanted to share with you is two real examples and how planning your shipping packaging is critical and how, sh how you should not take shortcuts when it comes to your packaging. And again, what's important here is I'm talking about shipping packaging, not your product display packaging, right? So when I talk packaging, sometimes people are like, well, Paul, I've got this great packaging for my product to put on a shelf. That's different than the packaging that you need to actually put that product into to get it to your customers, whether they're across the province, across the country, or on the other side of the world. Now, when I'm asked, when should I start looking at my packaging? I surprised a lot of people and shocked them with my answer because I always say during the R&D phase, yes, while you're still planning, building and testing different materials and sizes of your product, et cetera, is when you should be considering your packaging requirements because it will impact what the, your final product looks like, its weight, what materials, the size. It's gonna impact the packaging requirements for you to safely get your products around the world. And that is potentially gonna impact your costs and what additional uh, expenses you might have. So let me give you those two examples I talked about. The first one uh, is a, a product that a, a potential customer of ours was talking to us about. And they were excited because they did a lot of work and finally finished the product. Uh, and they were getting ready to actually start shipping the product. What they didn't take into consideration was the shipping packaging piece and what the restrictions or requirements might be when you're moving that through a courier environment. Again, this applies to all couriers, not just UPS. Uh, and in this specific example, the product that they had was relatively small when it came to its uh, uh, length and width, but the height of the product was very tall. In fact, it was six feet tall. Um, because of that, once they packaged it, when they actually looked at the length and girth of the actual completed packaging in order for the product to get shipped around the world, they realized that they were over the restrictions of courier companies as far as what we would accept as far as maximum sizes for a package. Because of that, a typical package for this customer that would have cost them um, maybe $50 to $80 to get it to the US, there was going to be a, an additional $900 cost because this package was now in the realm of what we call overmax. 
And over maximum means that in the career world, we really don't want it because it's too big for our environment. But if you do use us and you have no other choices and give it to us, we need to basically move that by hand through our entire environment, which gets very expensive for us. And that's where there's that additional cost. So think about this. Here's a product because of an additional two and a half inches in combined size, they've got this additional $900 charge. But if they had thought about this in advance, could they have modified their product so that it would have been two and a half inches smaller, therefore saving them all of that cost? So I wanted to share that one example to help drive that message. The second one happens to be with a someone that we met years ago in the East Coast uh, that actually uh, is selling barbecue sauce. And this particular customer uh, saw us presenting at an event, and we talked about packaging requirements like I am with you today. And afterwards came and talked to us at our booth and said, you know what, Paul, I wish we had talked to you several months ago because I never thought about the importance of my shipping, uh, uh, pro of my products, uh, until it was too late. They were excited because they were shipping locally in the East Coast their barbecue sauce, but just got a brand new deal with a national chain that was going to take them across Canada and across the U.S. And because their barbecue sauce was a premium gourmet type of product, they wanted to upgrade their packaging of their actual product for the shelf. So they spent a lot of time focusing on the packaging itself for the product and not the shipping requirement of it. And in doing so, they decided to go with a glass bottle. So it went from plastic to glass. Uh, and they ordered, uh, I think it was about three or four months supply of the new packaging. What they didn't rec recognize was that the glass was 30% heavier than the plastic bottle. So what does that mean to their shipping costs? It means that their shipping costs went up because their shipping now is heavier. Plus, they had basically no damages before with the plastic bottles, but even though they were trying to be very careful with their internal packaging, the odd time, and it wasn't often, but the odd time a glass bottle would break, a case of 12. Now, all you need to do is break one bottle of barbecue sauce. By the time it gets to its destination, that one bottle is now spilled its contents over the other 11 bottles, and you've basically got a, a complete case of 12 that you cannot sell. So thinking about your packaging during your R&D phase, especially if you wanna go global is critical because uh, it'll help you save cost, headaches and money. So again, tip four, include your packaging requirements into the final product to save you on your shipping costs. All right, next slide. Uh, here, we're gonna talk about customs clearance um, which refers to the process of getting goods through customs when they cross international borders. Now, this process can involve a range of procedures, fees, and regulations, which is very important for you to know. Uh, now, we've said this in our previous webinar, so if you've attended the, the first two we've had in this session so far, you know that we've covered some of this area where you, you need to take time to research and understand and get help from your broker and or logistics provider like UPS to actually give you the information you need. Before you ship, you need to be able to answer these questions that you see on a slide and have a great resource to help you uh, like CBSA. There's a link that you see at the bottom of the slide, but we'll share with you in the chat as well, which is a great resource because CBSA really helps you to try to understand what you need to do from a customs perspective and regulations to not just import your products into Canada, but to export your products out of Canada into the markets that you wanna go into. If we've got time at the end, uh, I'll be able to share with you one or two real examples um, on how not being prepared almost costs time, money, and in one scenario, the reputation of, uh, of one of our uh, customers. Uh, because the proper documentation was not used. So again, when we get to the Q&A, because I want to get to that soon, uh, if we have time, I'll, I'll share that one example with you. Uh, but what I'd like to do now is move on to the next slide, because I want to go through these five steps 
uh, relatively at a high level, but to help you a little bit more. So on this first one, know what your product is. It means exactly that. In this example, this is not just a running shoe that you see. You will notice that when you're looking at your product's commodity code, and there's different tools that you can use, like the example on this slide, which we'll put also in the chat. Uh, but there you can, most cases, um, the commodity code is going to provide you detailed information uh, that you got to be very careful with. So in this example, just filling out a customs form and saying a running shoe, you might assume that it's going to have these requirements and these costs from an exporting importing perspective, but it could be very different. Because in this example, this is a woman's sneaker with a le letter, leather upper and a rubber sole. And when you actually identify this product with the commodity code, it ends up being 640399. And that specific code will give you specific requirements, taxes, uh, and how and what is required. And in some cases, it might even tell you if you're even able to ship that into that country, right? That you're thinking of shipping it to. So it's important for you to identify clearly what your product is because slight variations could mean different code, which means a whole different set of rules. And now when we move to the next uh, step or next question, know where your product is going. Be sure to check with local country regulations about restricted, sorry, restricted goods, docu uh, documentation requirements, and customs clearance before you ship. Uh, TCS, EDC, all kinds of good resources that are out there, but make sure that you understand this clearly. And I'll give you an example. Alcohol is a heavily regulated in a few major countries around the world, like Australia, India, Israel, and even here in Canada. But don't limit your thoughts just to beverage type. Alcohol is used in other products like cosmetics, perfumes, and even hand sanitizers, right? So understanding what your product is made out of, having those details is critical because that'll let you know what is required when you're looking to go to certain markets around the world. So tip number five, research your product and its contents for any export or import restrictions that you might have. Now, when you move to the next question, ensure an import uh, important customs forms are completed accurately may help speed clearance in your destination market. So again, step three here is know which forms are required. Some of the top tips for your commercial invoice include ensuring a detailed description for each item is in the shipment. Each item must be on a separate line and the quantity and value is stated for each item and for the total shipment. Right? So you gotta provide details in, to ensure that when it's being reviewed, it's clearly understood. Because if it's not, it's gonna get pulled over to a pile that is gonna have more scrutiny, which just means now you've got delays and maybe potentially time and money to actually get that pushed through. So make sure you do the proper information completing all that. And finally, check to see if other forms are required, like certificate of origin, export license uh, into the US, you might need an FDA form and there's other forms that are required as well. When we get to the next slide, this one is quick because this is just knowing when the package needs to get there. This goes right back to my very first slide where advanced planning will help you balance between speed and cost. So you need to make sure you understand that because that'll help you when you're actually shipping internationally. And when we get to the final step on the next slide, um, it's actually uh, now, you know, before before I put it all together, it's evaluating your packaging, right? And we talked quite a bit about that as well. So ensure you have the required documentation. Know who is responsible for the shipment along its journey, right? So international shipments can be a challenging and expensive to retrieve if something goes wrong. So keep that in mind. You don't want to have to potentially abandon your package uh, if you didn't do the proper work up front and preparing it. And I know a lot of what I've been saying, you might be going, oh my God, this sounds really daunting and scary. 
well, soon we're going to have an opportunity to talk to an entrepreneur that's done it, right? And yes, there's a lot of information, but there is people that can help you. There are resources, there are organizations, your carrier, your broker, a lot of people that have the advice. It's just a matter of you asking your questions and doing your research just to make sure that you specifically are you prepared for your uh, specific product when you're going around the world. Now, I'm going to go to my last slide, which is basically to recap before we jump into uh, the Q&A session. And here, um, and we can advance uh, uh, a couple of them, uh, start understanding and planning your shipping and logistics um, uh, immediately so that you can save time and money down the road. That's important. Ensure that you and uh, the other parties, be it your supplier, your manufacturer, your distributor, even the end consumer, understand and agree who is responsible for the goods while in transit. Packaging your shipping, uh, um, packaging, sorry, and your shipping for your packaging needs to be part of your R&D phase, right? I think I drove that message at home. Get to know the customs and regulations for your products and choosing the right service provider uh, will ensure greater success as you expand your business around the world. So with that, I want to thank you everyone for your time and for your attention. And now I want to turn it back to Nadia so we can jump into the Q&A. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. That was a great presentation. And I loved how you got into all the details around the documentation, shipping, and we're really getting into this webinar on how to export. And I think that was a great kickoff to this session. And now I'm super excited to kick off our panel and bring up our guest entrepreneur, Evelyn, the founder of Ellie Bianca. Evelyn, we've heard from Paul, but we'd love to hear from you a little bit about your journey with exporting and also a bit about your company, Ellie Bianca, as well. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Paul. I think, you know, Paul really provided an in-depth, um, you know, details of, of what you need to know as you get ready uh, to export. So a little bit about uh, myself. Uh, I founded Eli Bianca in 2015, and it's been such a fun journey. When I started the brand, I knew that... Um, it will be a global brand. I, I knew that. I started with that in mind. Um, and of course, it's just been such a beautiful journey growing our product offering as, as well as growing uh, our market share. You know, I can tell you it's, it's still a learning process. It's still um, a, a challenge, but exciting. Um, but like Paul said, know your market, Plan, plan, plan in advance. Um, and yes, as you're doing your R&D, know your packaging. What exactly? How are you going to package it? How is it going to look? But it's also, I think it's it's good manufacturing practice to be able to make sure that um, you know the packaging because you need to be able to do your shelf life in that packaging. And sometimes think about it, whatever works in Canada, might not work in the Middle East where it's super hot. Oh. That's that's awesome. That's really good feedback. And I know with packaging, a lot of people recommend to start with a really limited run because to your point, you'll learn so much throughout the process. And if you've printed thousands, how are you going to take that feedback and learn? Um, that's a really good place to start. We'd, I'd love to learn a bit more about your experience with packaging and, and how you started to think about that when going into different markets and beginning to export. Yeah, you know, and I can say, it, you know, we haven't gotten where we've gotten without making mistakes. You know, I have... <laughs> at one point I bought 10,000 units, but they were the wrong packaging. I still have them kind of using them with, on R&D here and there. Um, so some things we've had to learn the hard way, but it doesn't have to be that. And I think that's why we're having these conversations so we can share our journeys and, and learn from the experts like Paul so that it can be a little better for you. So the, the key piece that really that has really helped us is just having the right partner, you know, having the right logistics partner. I cannot thank UPS enough, and they're not paying me to say this, but I cannot thank UPS enough for being that partner that I just have to pick up the phone call and be like, hey, I'm just trying to get this packaging um, from Europe 
to to hear what do you think what should we do should we have it on water should we ship it expedite it you know and just being able to work through and see what the best options are so the having that logistic partner that knows that can help you you know i have tried to go and sit uh, and try to clear my stuff myself at the beginning and sitting there you know they don't help you at border services they just give you, they give you the computer and just tell you to work it through. And, you know, until I found UPS and got to life, like, you know what, they can take care of that. I have better things that I actually love to do. And let me leave it to those that know how to do it so that they can broker my products and, and bring it in instead of me spending the whole day to fill the form only to realize that, oh, I don't have my import number and I have to try to call CRA at that point to, to register for it and figure things out. Yeah. That's awesome. I agree. Having that right partner is such a big factor. And I know a lot of people share that throughout your startup journey, think of your partners that you bring on board as a marriage, whether that's your logistics partner or your investors, because these are people who are going to be with you in the long term of your business. And you want to make sure that they're going to be there to support you. Speaking of partners and, and finding the right one, Paul, I wanted to ask you, I know, of course, hopefully we hope that most people will choose UPS as the, the partner, but what would your advice be for the startups that when they're looking for their logistics partner, when they're thinking about their supply chain, even, you know, brokers, how, what are some key criteria that they should be thinking about when evaluating partners? And Evelyn will let you add on to that afterwards as well, too. No, uh, it's a great question. Um, yeah, in fact, it's a, it's one, um, uh, Nadia, that uh, I ought to doing our startup tour that we just finished across the country um, because there is research. So this is not just, it, it, it's not Paul or even UP, uh, UPS's thought as far as um, what you should consider. This is third party research that you can find. So if you Google, you know, uh, what is the most important aspect of a logistics provider, of a courier provider, uh, you'll find a whole bunch of research online. And, and some of them I really enjoyed because the research was done with small business owners. So your peers, uh, asking them what they looked for, what was important to them. Uh, and at the top of the list, uh, we had elements like reliability, visibility, uh, cost obviously is a key factor. So who can help me uh, with some discounts or, or even just ways on how I can reduce costs because uh, there are ways of using different services. So if your provider has a service, but another provider has three services, a extremely fast, a slower, and a very slow service, well, that's a way of maybe saving costs as well too. But reliability is at the top of the list. Visibility is at the top of the list because uh, think about um, the world we live in today. When I started logistics a long time ago, I'm not gonna date myself, uh, but you know the shipper, was the ruler of how the shipments would actually go out. That's not the case anymore. There's a lot of power that the consumer now has. Think of yourself as a consumer. When you go online, a lot of cases, uh, you have options as to how, who you can choose, but more important, you have options as far as what you can see, visibility, right? So I wanna know that when I place that order, when is it actually gonna come out to me? When is it on its way? Uh, when is it gonna actually be delivered in a day or two? Is it tomorrow? Uh, if I'm, Is it going to my house? Am I going to be home? Uh, do I need to be home? So a lot of that is very important from that, from that aspect. So reliability, visibility, costs are the top three elements uh, that your peers seeing are the critical things when you're looking for a partner to go global. That's awesome. That's a great summary. And you heard it, the three insights. This is this is awesome. Evelyn, would you have any to add to that in terms of some of the criteria that when you were looking for your partner, uh, what made you choose UPS or what criteria were you looking for? Yeah, I think I think um, you know, Paul covered, you know, the main ones. But for me, what is so important is a partner because things are going to happen. There's going to be issues. You know, sometimes it's not always that everything gets delivered on time, the things just, you know, I needed that partner that we can work out the kinks together. So when I when complexity comes in, they're able to jump in and we can figure it out and, and really 
this is where I get to appreciate um, UPS. Or times when I'm in the lab, like today, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I forgot there's one ingredient that is somewhere lost somewhere and we are starting that I can actually reach out and be like, hey, can you, you know, where where is this? Where is it at? How quickly can we get it? So I feel like even though UPS can be can look like this giant uh, global company, but we are working as a team and we're growing as a team. So yeah, that a partner that can really work with you during challenging times. I love that. If, you're I, right. if I can add, Nadia, just something to that as well too. And and I'm starting to blush over here with all all the UPS compliments. You might not be able to tell, but I can. So thank you. Uh, but um, we joke the the, the broker slash courier industry uh, jokes a little bit because um, there's two key things when you go global. You need a good logistics shipper partner, but you also need a broker. And a lot of people don't recognize this, but UPS is actually one of the largest brokers in the world. So we can provide that solution for you as well. And, and the joke that is known within the industry is that you, you date your shipper, but you marry your broker. Um, and, and the reason for that and what they mean by that is, you know, hopefully you develop a great relationship with your shipping partner where you've got that long-term relationship. Uh, and that's what we work towards. And I think our competitors try to do the same, but we work very hard towards that, especially with our small business programs to try to hold your hand and help you as much as you can. But what is really critical when you're going global is a broker, right? Because a broker is the one that's really going to help you to ensure that you've got the right documentation, whether or not you're importing products into uh, Canada or you're exporting them. And there's other resources there, but a broker is definitely one that will help you, um, not just initially to get started, but when you do have that hiccup, when you know when you forgot the one form, or uh, and this happens because we're dealing with humans, right? I've been shipping stuff, uh, you know, from Toronto uh, via ground to the U.S., so I know it's going across Fort Erie. So the customs officials uh, on the other side of Fort Erie, the ones that have been clearing it, I've had no problems. All of a sudden, they're holding my product. We sometimes investigate that for you and realize, well, guess what? CBSA has changed their staff. There's new people, a new sheriff in town in that particular office. Uh, and they saw something on your your specific goods that they're questioning it. But it's a matter of us making sure we answered their questions, understanding that's what's going on. And boom, we're back up and running again without hopefully any further hiccups, right? But, but having a good broker, because uh, we're talking about going global, uh, is a very key element of that logistics component that you need. Yeah. And, and really to add to that, it's also so important, especially when you get yourself in countries where you might not speak the language. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. These are all such great insights. And I'm sure some people on the call might not even know the difference between broker and, and shipping and everyone's kind of learning all these different terms and concepts. So this is awesome. Um, one question I had is, I know, of course, you know, having a broker, shipping, all this is going to cost a lot of money. So there was a question in the chat, Evelyn, around knowing the right time um, to begin exporting. And maybe some of that is around like your brand awareness. Maybe some is around having the budget to do so. Um, I know we talked about it a bit in our last webinar as well. But how do you how did you go about thinking when was the right time for you to start exporting? Yeah. So, you know, for us at Eli Bianca, we knew from the start, you know, I've always so I've always been um, of that mindset of, you know, start with the end in mind. So I knew that we wanted to build a global um, brand. So we had that um, on, on the back of our pocket. However, it was really important for us to build um, a strong brand here in Canada. So building that brand awareness, being comfortable, ironing the kinks, getting to know your logistic partner really well, and, and getting to decide who do you want to, to, to work with. Um, so I will say, you know, it doesn't need to be that way, but for us, that's how it was, just building that strong brand awareness locally because beauty is extremely competitive. So when you're trying to pitch it into in another market, they also want to know, you know, where are you selling the product in Canada? You know, you build kind of that confidence. But then on the other hand, it also gave us the time to do our stability testing. So be able to know our products really well. Um, but 
you know, if you have done good market research, it's so important to do market research to the country that you're going into, you know, understanding the needs and preferences of that market, understanding the local regulation and understanding culture. Um, extremely, how do they do business? You know, no, you know, it's so, so important uh, before one gets ready to, to go international. A hundred percent. And I know that's always a big theme across all of our webinars is the importance of research. And to your point, you know, whether that's regulations, marketing, um, there's so much to understand around the culture and, and making sure that you're ready and, and having all of this as part of your export plan and not just jumping into it right away. Paul, is there anything you'd like to add, maybe even specifically from supply chain, shipping logistics? Um, now I know this webinar is on the how and you talked to it in your presentation. What are some of those things that the entrepreneurs should have ready to go before starting? Well, I'd like to actually give another example because I, I love Evelyn's, uh, you know, her answer was perfect, I think, because it's, you know, her business plan was an end goal was she wanted to be a global brand, but she really wanted to make sure she built that and how to sell a product within our own market uh, to then start taking that global. But, you know, for businesses that are out there that might be still thinking that, yes, you know what? I want to do the same thing as well. But when is it the right time to go? Uh, and there's so many different ways of looking at that. And there's a lot of experts that can share information for you. But one place you can look at is just within your own uh, activity, your own analytics that you can pull off of your website. So Google Analytics, as well as some tools up there like Similar Web, are tools that businesses can actually see to what kind of traffic you're getting. And I've talked to some of our customers that you know are starting to go global. Uh, but by looking at the analytics, they recognized that they were getting interest from people on their website from countries that they didn't even think of going to next. Uh, there's one that I can think of top of mind that, you know, they um, they went to the U.S. and they were now, I think, considering the U.K. as well, too, as an option. But when they looked at the analytics on their website, they were having more interest on their website coming from Turkey than they were currently having from the U.S. and they were already selling into the U.S. So that was a light bulb for them to go, I need to go and understand why there's so much interest from Turkey for my products. And that could be a good place for you to look at to see why is that an interest? And maybe that could be uh, a good opportunity for you to start planning and to actually go, um, uh, go global uh, and, and know which market to go to. Um, but as far as being prepared, um, you know, packaging, what I shared from a packaging perspective, it, it's the same if you're shipping a package across to another province, to the U.S. or around the world, right? So that that's all the same. I don't think there's changes there. It's really just the forms. When it comes to us, it's making sure that information is clean and clear, um, not just to avoid any regulations and customs issues, but also costs for you, right? I mean, we've seen examples of customers that have, you know, saying, well, I'm gonna build into the, my product, um, the cost of shipping, maybe even the cost of customs and duties, and I'm gonna build all that into my margin. So, you know, and that's what their business model is built around. But when they go and actually start shipping, they realize, well, I had the wrong commodity code. I had the wrong information. And guess what, guess what, my uh, customs, tariff code uh, and my taxes therefore into the market I'm going to is not 12%, it's 18%. Well, an extra 6% coming off of your bottom line could be a big problem for your product and for your business, right? So it's really the customs forms and the information and making sure you've got that completely ironed out and, and in control uh, really will help you and God will save a lot of headache and a lot of time. That's yeah, a, actually, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, actually that last part, Paul, got me um, a little excited here. Um, you know, when you, your pricing strategy, um, 
for local market cannot be the same as your international market. So when you're looking at your overall um, you know, expansion strategy going global, you also need to have a look and see what are some of the other costs. So this needs to be a big line item that you have to assess. And definitely you got to look at those taxes as well. So I recommend make sure that you actually, you know, now there's no COVID, you can fly around, physically go to the market, go to that region, get to understand and if you, and have a local person working with you because there's so many other things that might just pop out of the blue that you might not know. That's a great point. And especially on the pricing, you never know, even besides thinking about the costs, competitors pricing might be different in different markets and your price might be good in your market, but it might be way higher or way cheaper in another market. So keeping that in mind and definitely on visiting the market too. I know there's a lot of trade missions that you can participate in and um, you can go with a delegate, a delegation of different people who are also entrepreneurs in Canada. Sometimes it's industry focused, sometimes it's market focused. So definitely keeping an eye out for those trade missions and, and using that as opportunities to go visit new markets and see where you want to expand to. Yeah, and, in, and also you can get a lot of information from even before you travel from the Trade Commission office. So reaching out mm -hmm. in advance, letting them know, um, or even as you're pr planning to visit, they're just always a comfortable place to start that can kind of help you navigate uh, a new place. 100%. Who your competitors are, right, Evelyn? They can tell you if there's competitors in that market, they can help you see uh, if there's distributors or partners that you can consider in that market for your product. And there's, there's a lot that they can, they, they can definitely do for you. You just got to ask. Yeah. And, and even, and actually even what I love the most, I love the trade commissioner office is that they can come to meetings with you in some cases. Mm -hmm. So when you're going to meetings and you're negotiating and the government of Canada is there with you, you gain credibility. So like they are, they're huge, they're helpful. And all of that is free. It's awesome. Yeah, we have such incredible resources and I know Miriam's sharing the links to them into the chat too. So you should definitely check those out. Um, one question I had as well, I know Evelyn, we were talking a bit earlier about retail distribution and how you're using UPS for some of your retailers. I know you mentioned you're in Costco, which is super exciting. Uh, and for some of the people on the call, they might also be interested in retail distribution or B2B partnerships. Does any of what we've shared today change when we think about some of those bigger orders and, and partnering with some of those retailers? Yeah, you know, so definitely um, when working with bigger retailers like Costco, uh, and of course, you know, uh, UPS works with Costco. There's so many other things now you have to do in, in terms of technology. I think there's a UPS technology. Maybe Paul can talk about that. Um, I just had to connect with, with them to help us. But it was so much easier because we were already set up with, with UPS um, to kind of do the final touches of linking that back and tech component so that we are able to generate labels and, and quickly ship um, with Costco. That's awesome. Paul, do you have anything to add um, around like, you know, working with bigger partners or retailers or, or anything along those lines? Um, I mean, it's, it's uh, to be honest, when it comes to, to a question like that, it's what I learned from talking to the people that are on this webinar today, right? So I, I I love my job because I talk to entrepreneurs and small businesses every day, and I'm learning every day about these different things. But uh, there's there's pros and cons to, to, to different ones. Some of it has to do with the market you're going to. Some of it has to do with the product that you're selling. Um, but, you know, uh, whether or not you're going the route of using a distributor to grow your brand in another market, pros and cons to that. Going to the end consumer in another market, pros and cons to that as well too. So it's really, I think, understanding what your ultimate objectives are with your brand um, and your business, and then understanding the market that you wanna go into, the best way of executing in, in that market um, is, and again, I'm sharing with you all of those points. That's all stuff I've learned from entrepreneurs that have been trailblazers and I've done that before. A hundred percent. 
This is all really great advice. And I know there's lots of questions being asked in the chat too. And Felipe from UPS has been jumping in and, and answering a lot of those questions for you there as well, which is awesome. I know we're coming to the end of our time, which is crazy to see how much the time is flying by. So I wanted to ask one more question for each of you. And I think, you know, we talked about a lot of different information today around logistics and preparing for export. If you could have each of the attendees today walk away with one learning, one key takeaway, or like one resource or piece of advice, what would be that one thing that people should take away when thinking about logistics and beginning that how of the exporting journey? And I'll start with uh, Paul this time. Um, so for, for me, it's simple. Um, think of your logistics the, and, and that's a broad term, right? So shipping, receiving, importing, exporting, brokerage, warehousing, packaging, all of that. Think of it up front. Uh, I've seen it way too often and I get it, especially for an entrepreneur. I get it. You are trying to develop your product. You're trying to get funding for your product. You're trying to get it off the ground. But if you do all of that and you don't have that back end ready, especially if you want to take your product uh, global, you're slowing yourself down because you're going to have to then do more tweaking. You have to make adjustments. You'll be taking steps backwards. So my number one advice is think of that upstream. Really think of the logistics and all the different components of that upstream and how we can impact. Or if you do it right, how it can benefit you from growing faster and better than maybe your competition is doing is definitely the one thing I would advise everyone. If I, if there was a wish I can grant everyone, I would have every entrepreneur go down to what we call the world port. In Louisville, Kentucky, we've got what we call our world port. It's our air hub that connects the world for UPS around the world. And I wish everyone can see that because on a nightly basis, there's about 150 to 160, don't quote me, around that, brown tails. Brown tails, basically, it's it's an airplane, but it's we call it brown tail because it's got the UPS shield on, right? So it's our aircraft. Uh, and there's about 150 to 160 that land in Louisville every single night, Monday to Friday. And after they all land, everything's unloaded, moves, moves through the operation, and back out they go to where they came from around the world. And we're talking about tens of millions of packages a day. We do a great job of delivering about 97 to 98% on time when it's supposed to be delivered, which from a percentage perspective is phenomenal. But 2% of tens of millions of packages a day is still a lot of packages that don't get there. And when we look at it, labels coming off, packages being held because of customs, Packages breaking open because they weren't properly packaged, all that. And sometimes those ones cause issues and damage other packages that actually were okay. But they, you know, it just happened to be next to that one, right? So so I wish people can actually go down there and see that because it is eye-opening how important when you want to be a global business, the logistics piece can be. And having control over that and not having control over that could mean the difference between being successful or not successful globally. I love that point. And I think for everyone on the call, you know, coming to webinars like this, coming to be a part of the Women's Exporter Program, getting access to these resources and firsthand insights, you're already taking that first step and being prepared and looking ahead and, and thinking about all those things. So I love that point. Evelyn, what would be your one takeaway for everyone on the call today? You know, it's, it's harder for me to provide a one takeaway. I would just say that if we are th when you think about you know, the five facets of business or the seven facets of business, you're thinking about, you know, your finance, your marketing and sales, um, you know, your technology and everything. For me, logistics is equally important. You know, I add that into processes. Mm -hmm. So why do I say that? And, and we, we've we had in so many incidents, but during the pandemic, um, if we did not have UPS, we could not have responded as quickly as we did. Um, so being able to, I mean, I don't like to send a note to Paul, but being able to send a note and be desperate and be like, hey, Paul, I'm desperate. Can you please check where my package is? Because it means it's just almost a matter of life and death for me to put this um, product out. 
you know, if I didn't have that, I couldn't have done it. it you know, it was a matter of, you know, it, it, it ships today for me to meet that target or we lose it all together. So equally important as you're planning, um, you know, your finances, you're looking at your market, you, your logistic partner has to be part of that starting. It cannot be the one you do at the end. A hundred percent. I think when we think about our customer experience and our brands, we always think about that marketing. We think about that forward facing, you know, social media, but this is equally as important of a part of a customer experience and on-time delivery and making sure that you deliver the product properly into a customer's hand, into that retailer. This is all key important aspects as well. Yeah. So I mean, I'll that. give you a quick, quick example. We just had for our holiday part, like holiday campaign, a customer changed their mind and they wanted something different. So our printer could print the packaging fairly quickly, but UPS was able to bring it to us so that we can deliver. Ah, oh, that's amazing. <laughs> I love hearing these success stories and, and these partnerships and collaborations. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. I know we touched a lot of different things. And of course, there's always so much more that we can cover as well. But I'm really happy we got to have Evelyn today and Paul joining us to share all about logistics, transportation, and really that how of exporting. We'll be in touch tomorrow or later this week with the recording of the webinar, along with the feedback survey, and make sure that you fill that out. Again, that is how we know how to make these sessions as best as we can, because we're designing them for all of you. And we want to make sure that they're the most helpful as possible. Thank you again to both of our speakers for donating your time and expertise. The next webinar for Women's Exporter Program will be on January 30th. So this will be the last one of 2023 before we get into 2024. Make sure that you register for that session because that's how you'll get the link to the Zoom call and make sure that you'll have access to all the follow-up resources. So make sure you take a moment. Um, Miriam will be sharing the link to register in the chat. Maybe even just take a couple minutes right now to go in, register, and make sure that you have that. I know we're coming into the holiday season as well. And I think, you know, as Startup Canada, we always love supporting small businesses, entrepreneurs. So think about how maybe you can incorporate that into your holiday shopping, into your holiday giving. I know Evelyn is going to be doing, she mentioned her holiday campaign in the, in the last question. So think about how you can support some of those entrepreneurs with, with your holiday shopping. Thank you again, everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll see you in the new year.